see up there? Monroe 200, a bicentennial history of Monroe County, Florida. So uh, uh, I got to say, this trying to jam 200 years into about 45, 50 minutes has been uh, a, a very tough challenge. Uh, <laughs> so I, I've had to leave some favorite stories on the cutting room floor, just inevitable. But uh, anyway, hopefully I've been able to, uh, through all of this, weave sort of a thread through time that makes some sense at the end of it all. Shows how we got to where we are. Um, anyway, so that's uh, tonight's subject. Um, my job is uh, I'm the lead historian for the Florida Keys History Center. And uh, uh, if you're not familiar with the Florida Keys History Center, we are the room in the back of the library. And uh, uh, we're part of the library system, obviously, a county office. Um, and we are tasked with the mission uh, to explore, preserve, promote, and make accessible the history of Monroe County, Florida. Uh, and really, uh, uh, that means uh, uh, we have a large archive back there. Uh, we have lots of historical research materials, and people walk in with strange questions, and they want to know something about you know the history of their house or some aspect of the islands here. And uh, we help them find that information. So if you ever have historical questions, come on back there. Um, we do a lot of outreach. Um, we have a website. You can see on the bottom of the screen there, uh, part of the Keys Library's uh, website system. Uh, check that out. Um, we uh, are very active in social media. So follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Um, we published every day, this day in Keys history. So I've uh, been adding a lot of fun new content there. So follow that. And uh, we've also recently launched a monthly, uh, I guess, blog, whatever you want to call it, uh, called Island Chronicles. And uh, we're going to be exploring just different aspects of Keys history. Sign up for the newsletter. You can do it at the website. And that will be sent directly to you once a month. So lots going on, lots of outreach, uh, lots of research happening at the Florida Keys History Center. Let's get going with Monroe 200. I'm going to start here. I promise you this is my only slide with text on it. I hate, it. I hate when people do that. But this uh, sort of cuts to the heart of, you know, uh, honestly, a lot of people don't know what a county is. You know that it's a certain part of the state, but why? Well, a county... Uh, initially, was uh, they were designed uh, to carry out the functions at the local level um, on behalf of the state. So uh, it was a way to access government uh, uh, functions and resources at a local level. I imagine if we didn't have counties, everything we did, you know, sort of government-wise, we'd have to go to Tallahassee to do. It wouldn't be very effective. So uh, the, the county system sort of brings state government down to our level and, and makes it much more accessible. Of course, counties over time have taken on a much greater burden and a much wider role and do all sorts of different things that they didn't uh, back in 1823. <clears throat> now, of course, you know, we're talking in the Monroe 200, that's 200 years. There were people here long, long before, all right? So uh, approximately, as far as we know, 5,000 years ago, there were native peoples living here in the Florida Keys. Keep in mind, that's 25 bicentennials. So they were here for a very long time. Um, anyway, uh, uh, they lived uh, uh, what was probably a pretty idyllic lifestyle, you know, living off of the ocean largely. And, and uh, um, they uh, uh, were sort of an independent group, at least in the, the, the proto-historic times. Uh, people always ask, you know, who were the who was the tribe down here? Well, they didn't really, they weren't the Calusa, they weren't the Tequesta, um, they were sort of just the Keys people down here and, and uh, had their their own subculture. Now, their their lives were upended in 1513 when Juan Ponce de Leon, the Spanish explorer, came through, made note of the Keys. Um, we see this map here. This is the first map to really show the Florida Keys. Uh, this was made in 1515. It's called the Freducci map. Uh, but this is the first map to show Florida, 
All right, it says Florida there. But it, as I say, it shows the keys very clearly here. You can see the Key Largo stands out. I know. Uh, here it says uh, Islas de las Tortugas, so uh, Island of the Tortugas, and then they call the keys generally the Martires, so the Martyrs, meaning uh, as Ponce de Leon sailed by, he thought they looked like the heads of suffering men floating on the ocean. So uh, uh, we get na were named the Martyrs for a while. Uh, here we see a couple hundred years later another Spanish map, and this really uh, shows, I think, the still existing Spanish influence, at least on our geography down here. Um, really, from the Tortugas all the way to Quilardo, about uh, half of our islands still bear Spanish names from that very early colonial period. So, uh, um, uh, we definitely are still living the Spanish colonial period, whether we know it or not, uh, through, through a lot of these names. Now, when Spain gave up Florida in uh, 1819, formally turned it over to the United States in 1821, uh, this is how Florida was conceived, all right? You had uh, uh, West Florida and East Florida, and that uh, uh, had been that way for quite a while. And the West Florida and East Florida were the first two counties. Uh, we have Escambia County to the west and St. John's County to the east. So those were the first two counties. But now, as Florida began to be settled, more and more people started coming, more and more people needed access to government resources, and so uh, uh, Florida started uh, in the 1820s to be divided up into other counties. And uh, we see on July 3rd, of 1823 to satisfy the need for a new county in South Florida, the Territorial Council passed what was called an act to provide for the organization of a county south of Charlotte Harbor in the territory of Florida. And it was essentially all of South Florida below Lake Okeechobee it became Monroe County. This, you see, is a, a map showing that original Monroe County right there. Look how big. Uh, it was, like I say, all of South Florida. Now, people continued to uh, uh, settle in, in the mainland and other areas, and uh, uh, Monroe County changed over time. So here we have the original. Then Monroe County is added. See, in 1836, Dade County is added, and when Dade County is added, it takes the Florida Keys from uh, Bay of Honda northward. They become part of uh, Dade County. Indian Key, little tiny Indian Key that you see off the highways, you go, that was the first county seat of Dade County, believe it or not. And so uh, uh, it had some influence that place. Now, um, Indian Key wound up not being successful, or the, the the keys were reabsorbed into Monroe, uh, and then over time we see Lee County and later Collier split that and gives us, in uh, by 1887, our modern borders that we have today. Now in December, December 19th of 1821, a man named John W. Simonson, an American businessman, he bought the island of Key West from a uh, Cuban Spaniard named Juan Pablo Salas. Um, Salas had been granted Key West as uh, uh, a reward for his service in the Spanish army, um, but he decided to sell it for $2,000 to uh, uh, Simonton, and uh, that then led uh, a few months later to the U.S. flag being planted on the island. Um, in March of 1822, formally making Key West and then by extension the Florida Keys uh, a part of the U.S. territory. It's interesting, the Keys had kind of been a no man's land. Florida was turned over, but nobody really knew if the Keys were Spanish or American now, and so by planting the flag and with no Spanish resistance, they were by default American. Uh, so uh, uh, the same thing happened in 1824. A man named Isaac Cox bought Kivaca Marathon from uh, Don Francisco Ferrara. Uh, real estate prices had gone up. He bought Marathon for $3,000. So 
couple of years later. Now, at this time, one of the biggest issues in the Florida Keys was piracy. Um, now, Key West and you know the other Keys, there were never really pirate hangouts. There was no town here with taverns and pirates roaming the streets. That never, ever happened down here. But you did have a lot of pirates operating in the 1820s um, out of the Cuban coast, the Yucatan coast, Puerto Rico, and those pirates would come up into the Florida Straits here, the waters between here and Cuba, and they would attack ships sailing out of the Caribbean, sailing out of the Gulf of Mexico towards the east coast of the U.S. or towards Europe, and they would plunder these ships, and they would very often murder the crews and the passengers, and it was a huge, huge problem, uh, and it was really throttling uh, not only people were perishing, but it was throttling uh, the economic engine of shipping. And, and the U.S. government said, hey, you know, Key West may be great, but we got to stop these pirates. And so they sent uh, an anti-piracy squadron down here in very short order, 1822. And then in 1823, they put uh, this man on the right, Commodore David Porter, in charge of the uh, anti-piracy fleet in, in the... Uh, Caribbean. They were based here in Key West, established a base, and he worked pretty hard, and he was uh, uh, quite inventive. He came with a fleet of small ships, schooners and uh, other small ships, that could get into where the pirates were hiding and, and uh, really take care of them uh, effectively, and it worked. And within just uh, a couple of years, Porter and his uh, crew had pretty much eradicated the pirates uh, that were haunting the Florida Straits. In the, uh, uh, well, the, 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 the communities, once the pirates were gone, the communities really uh, uh, started to thrive. Here we see, uh, uh, this is Knight's Key. Um, as you come off the Seven Mile Bridge towards Marathon, the first island you hit is Knight's Key. Well, that's what it looked like in 1825, but you can see the houses starting there. This is Key West in 1826, so, um, you know, it's, it's starting to become a, a, a little town and, and, you know, some success happening there. And really, uh, for all any of the settlements in the Keys, uh, this was their big economic engine. Uh, I mentioned all those ships sailing by, but we have our reefs lurking offshore there, and very often those ships would simply, uh, in the middle of the night, go, you know, boom and hit the reef, or a storm would drive them onto the reef, but anyway, lots and lots and lots of shipwrecks in the Florida Keys, and so you have this wrecking industry established here right from the get-go, and these guys would uh, wait for ships to wreck, and then when the ships did wreck, they would dash out, they would provide aid, they would hopefully refloat the vessel, if they couldn't get the vessel off, they would uh, get the cargo off, save the people that were on board, and then bring them back here, and uh, for their efforts, they would be granted uh, an award. Now, in 1828, uh, there was a court set up here to oversee the whole process, to make it you know, as fair as could be. Uh, a lot of the ship's owners didn't like the records, they thought they were uh, pirates themselves, but, uh, you know, I always say it's sort of akin to a, uh, a tow truck driver, you know? Yeah. Nobody likes a tow truck driver. When you need them, you need them, all right? And uh, that was the case with the records. So, uh, uh, anyway, they really brought in a huge amount of money. Uh, uh, you know, these cargoes would come into Key West here, they would be sold, or they would become part of the island life. Um, and, and the community here really, really began to thrive. Uh, by the 1830s, we start seeing uh, the community uh, building up even more, and then in the, the later 1830s, you get a pretty big influx of Bahamian settlers. The conks start coming here, and uh, um, they bring with them a, a, a strong suite of maritime skills and blend in with the wrecking community and, and uh, become fishermen and all of that and, and really uh, give uh, the community a big boost. Indian Key, I mentioned it earlier, uh, also began to grow. A 
about this time. Um, in 1824, a store was actually opened on Indian Key to serve the needs of anybody in the Upper Keys. Um, and then, in 1830, a man named Jacob Hausman uh, went to Indian Key, and he basically said he was going to, to set out the uh, or establish the alternative to Key West. All right, and he he set out to rival the Key West wreckers and build a wrecking community up there. Um, and did actually pretty well at it. And, and Indian Key um, was, uh, like I say, by 1836, big enough to be the county seat of Dade County. Now, in 1840, tides turned for Indian Key. Uh, the, the small island and small community was attacked by Seminole warriors in the Seminole Wars, and much of the settlement was destroyed. And Indian Key really never uh, fully recovered after that. Key West, though, we see, only kept growing. This is Key West in 1855. Uh, you can see it is really a, a bustling town. Uh, uh, wrecking had brought in a huge amount of money. Uh, there was, uh, uh, by this point, uh, one of the largest cities, if not the largest, and certainly the wealthiest in Florida. So uh, Key West was uh, quite the success. Now. In the 1850s, things started changing a little bit. The government put some pretty big investment into establishing lighthouses along the reef. You know, all the Key Westers were making a huge uh, lump of money off of wrecking, uh, but it still wasn't good for business that all these ships were going on the reef. So uh, the government built lighthouses uh, uh, from the Tortugas all the way up. Um, and it took about 20 years or so to do. They started in the 1850s. And ultimately, with those lighthouses, wrecking started to wane. Because now people knew, okay, there's a light there. I stay away from that, and I'll be safe. And um, so you didn't have as many ships running onto the reef. Um, it's still a few, but the wrecking culture started to fade away. Um, also, uh, another uh, big government project happened, started in the 1840s. Uh, we see in the Dry Tortugas and in Key West, Forts Jefferson and Taylor being built. These were part of the U.S. Uh, coastal defense system, a, a new uh, a project of the, the government to uh, defend the U.S. coast. And, of course, these two forts were to protect the Florida Straits and the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico. Massive, massive brick structures um, that were built uh, in good measure with enslaved uh, laborers uh, at doing the work, uh, at least the, the, the worst of the work. Um, and you had uh, uh, really uh, Key West slave owners uh, renting their people to the U.S. government who would then put them to work uh, building these things. So it was a pretty crazy system. Um, it was the largest use of enslaved people in the Florida Keys. Um, we never had plantations that, you know, like people pick cotton. That didn't happen down here because it just wasn't the environment for it. Um, most people were in domestic servitude or working on the forts. Now, in 1861, the U.S. Civil War broke out, and because these forts were here, and we had an army presence on the island, we had a navy presence on the island, they quickly secured these two forts, and the Florida Keys stayed under Union control through the entirety of the Civil War, right? And that uh, was crucial, because Key West, in particular, uh, became... Uh, uh, an essential part of the Gulf blockading squadron. And they brought in, they captured out of Key West over 200 Confederate uh, ships sailing in, trying to supply the, the, the South. And uh, they seized those ships, auctioned off the goods, sold the ships themselves. So uh, uh, again, it was a, a variant of the wrecking, except it was blockading. Now, because Key West was under Union control. In 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, 
it was law down here. It, it, it made sense. So there were enslaved people. Now this Emancipation Proclamation has been passed. And all the people that were enslaved in Key West in January of 1863 were free. Um, and uh, um, there was a big celebration. Uh, we have some pretty good accounts of that. Led by this man right here, Sandy Cornish. Sandy Cornish was uh, a man who had uh, been enslaved in Maryland, made his way to Port Leon near Tallahassee, Florida. Um, some men tried to kidnap him and sell him into slavery in New Orleans. He fought them off after he had, had uh, uh, gotten away from them. He marched himself into the town square of Port Leon chopped his fingers off with an axe, stabbed himself on the hip, cut his Achilles, Achilles tendon, and said, okay, I am no longer of any value to anybody as a slave. And uh, um, he made his way down after he healed. He, he and his wife made their way down here to Key West. Sandy Cornish became uh, a, a very successful farmer. Um, he... Uh, uh, entirety of the, the St. Mary's grounds uh, in, in downtown here of uh, Sandy Cornish's farm. And uh, was very successful and the de facto leader of the black community. Like I said, he led the march when everybody was free. Now, just a few days after, uh, the uh, union came down and recruited uh, from this pool of newly freed people and uh, recruited 126 men into the U.S. colored troops, and we recently had a memorial in Bayview Park established to those uh, guys who uh, quickly left Key West and went into South Carolina in the, the, for the Union cause. Uh, after the, the Civil War, after the Civil War, after our Civil War ended, another one kind of started up in Cuba, and you had uh, people who wanted to break away from Spanish rule, uh, uh, starting to, uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of trouble growing in Cuba, basically. You had the Spanish loyalists, and you had the, the people who wanted an independent Cuba going at it, a lot of political tension, violence, and that then, uh, caused a lot of Cubans to want to get out of there, and they came here to Key West. And so in the late 1860s, you see this huge influx of Cubans coming into the island, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, these refugees have been cigar makers or cigar workers, and they brought uh, <coughs> their cigar business <coughs> to the island, and that then became, for decades, one of the mainstays of the Key West economy was uh, uh, cigar making. Uh, for decades, Key West population was uh, essentially one-third Cuban. Pretty much everybody here spoke Spanish or some uh, uh, some degree of Spanish, I should, I should say. And uh, as I mentioned, the cigar industry lasted up into the 1920s. Now, around this same time, Monroe County opened the first uh, public schools. Uh, of course, uh, they were segregated. We had uh, white students went to one school, black students went to another school. But uh, certainly the birth of the public schools around 1870. Now, outside of cigar making, uh, the Bahamian Conks, uh, uh, they carried on with their maritime ways. You see a lot of uh, turtling happening here. Sponging uh, became huge, was another uh, uh, big money maker down here. And of course, uh, they hung on to uh, uh, whatever wrecking was going on down here as well. So still very much a maritime uh, community. In the Upper Keys, things were a little bit different. From the mid-1800s on, people realized, hey, you know, these are some pretty big islands here, and the soil's not bad. And uh, they began farming up there. And so you have Kivaka, Marathon, uh, uh, the Matacumbes, uh, uh, Isla Mirada, Plantation Key, Key Largo. Uh, there were uh, lots of farms up there. And uh, they grew a variety of things, uh, vegetables and fruits and limes and that sort of thing, but the big, big crop was pineapple. And for, uh, again, probably about 50, 60 years, you saw a lot of pineapple growing, uh, happening in 
in the upper keys. So a uh, pretty uh, rustic lifestyle that they lived up there, but uh, they, they made a go of it. And there were little communities that formed. There were about half a dozen communities like this that formed in the upper keys. Um, this is a, a these are photos of a town called Planter, and Planter was on Key Largo. Um, and you see they, they had these communities, maybe a, you know, a dozen families living there, and they had these long docks that went out into the water, and that's how they carried their pineapples out, loaded them onto schooners, and sold them down here in Key West or wherever they could sell them. Um, so uh, uh, made quite a go of it. Now, in 1886, Key West suffered a huge setback. Um, it was a devastating fire that broke out, and it burned much of the downtown. You can see all that blackened area there shows you what was burned. Um, One and a half million dollars worth of damage in 1886. Tremendous. I mean, look, things were just leveled. Um, so... Uh, uh, that was a, a huge blow to Key West. There's been some suspicion. Uh, there was suspicion then. There's still suspicion now that this fire might have been started by Spanish loyalists who were trying to disrupt um, a lot of the support that was coming out of Key West for an independent Cuba. So uh, can't prove it, but it's certainly, uh, like I say, is suspicious. The city rebuilt. You can see this is uh, just a couple years after the fire here, maybe five years after the fire. And uh, uh, the city came back uh, stronger than ever. And this picture is actually uh, one of the first to show what was the next big revolution in, uh, for, for life in, in the Keys, electric poles. <laughs> this is about 1890, 91. I think this building was 91. So this is right around then. And uh, it's one of the first photos to show uh, electricity being used. And, and, you know, imagine, that was a huge uh, improvement in life down here. You could do things at night now. You could have fans. You could, you know, live a much more comfortable life. So uh, uh, certainly a huge change for Key West. Uh, Key West was also an increasingly important port. Uh, really, from after the Civil War on, you had steamships coming here. Um, we had the, the Mallory Steamship Line was the big one, and they ran consistently for decades from New York to Key West to Galveston and back. Um, they also ran uh, from Tampa and Cuba, and so from really uh, uh, the 1870, let's say, on up until really uh, close to World War II, Steamships coming in and out of Cuba and really being a lifeline for the community, bringing uh, uh, supplies and goods and people um, you know, in and out, back and forth. So um, very, very important. By the early 1890s, um, as I mentioned with the fire, the Cuban independence movement was really uh, dominating local uh, uh, politics here, especially in the Cuban community. And you had uh, Jose Marti, the great uh, Cuban independence leader, uh, coming to Key West. And he would give speeches and hold rallies and raise money and just, you know, generally stir up excitement for the, uh, the, the free Cuba uh, movement. And you had men also training. Here they are at the, the West Martello Tower um, training, um, getting ready to fight down in Cuba. So uh, uh, exciting times uh, back then. You also had uh, um, filibusters operating out of the Keys, and they operated up and down the Keys, and they would organize shipments from uh, the U.S., from the Keys primarily, down into Cuba, and they would carry uh, weapons, they would carry men, they would carry supplies to help fuel uh, the independence movement. Now, in 1898, uh, things were really starting to come to a head uh, with the uh, Cuban Revolution. Um, the Navy sent ships down here with the goal of really trying to stop these filibusters from going down there. Um, but they were here, uh, you know, also just as a show of strength against Spain. 
Um, and the USS Maine, the battleship Maine, went down to Havana in January of 1898. It was uh, sent to there to protect uh, American interests uh, on the island, uh, just in case there was uh, trouble. And in the evening of February 15th, the Maine blew up in Havana Harbor. It sank, uh, as we've learned uh, through time, when its gunpowder magazines exploded. Many of the sailors on the Maine were killed. They were buried here on Key West. Um, public sentiment was really, uh, uh, what do I say, uh, anti-Spanish because of this. People blamed Spain for the explosion of the Maine, and that really uh, drove the U.S. into what became the Spanish-American War. And this, once again, then made Key West a very important military base. The island was also headquarters for what was a very animated press corps who had come from across, <laughs> across the United States. Uh, and they were all headquartered here in Key West. And putting out with every story, their byline was Key West. And what you're seeing there is uh, really one of the very first films made on this island in 1898 by uh, Thomas Edison's crew, um, and they were filming those reporters rushing to the telegraph office to file their latest dispatches. So, uh, uh, amazing stuff, but I gotta say, those guys, those, those huge, huge number of reporters who reported for papers across the country really put Key West in, in the brains of folks uh, uh, around the U.S. Now, as the Spanish-American War faded, the wealthy industrialist Henry Flagler, wanting to take advantage of the newly constructed Panama Canal, began a railroad that would connect Key West and the Florida Keys with the mainland. Now, this crazy idea, and seemingly nuts idea, uh, it had been floated for years, 20 years at least, um, but Flagler, he had the resources. He'd worked for Standard Oil. He made a lot of money. And he had that drive. And he, uh, he could make it happen. So construction on this idea of this overseas railroad began in Homestead in 1905. And it was uh, just utterly revolutionary for the Keys. It, it uh, now linked all the islands together. Uh, other communities began to pop up. Uh, along the, the railway line, here you see the beginning of the Big Pine Key and the, the very first Marathon Post Office. Um, but these are all now becoming railroad towns, growing because this railroad brings in people, brings in goods, bring, you know, gives them a reason to, to be. Uh, so the railroad was crucial, not just for Flagler, but really for the Keys and the, uh, the society now. Now, in 1912, after seven years of work, Flagler's Folly, as, as it had been dubbed, uh, was open for business. Flagler made it on the first train down. Uh, there was a huge celebration here in Key West uh, because this was now the beginning of a new era for the Florida Keys. And uh, for the next 20 plus years, uh, this was a common sight down here. Uh, the Overseas Railroad, carried goods and people between Key West, through the Florida Keys, to Miami, and beyond. So uh, you could theoretically take the railroad from Key West to New York City, and uh, that was a pretty big deal in 1912. We don't have a lot of uh, film of the railroad, but there is this. Uh, this this actually comes uh, as a clip used in a Chevrolet commercial in 1935. But, that's, but anyway, it gives you a sense of probably going over Long Key uh, Viaduct, really don't know. Uh, anyway. Now, uh, uh, railroads built, now war breaks out again. This time it's World War I. Uh, and with World War I, we see Key West's importance as a naval base being reaffirmed. Uh, submarines were stationed down here. Uh, we have the beginnings of the, uh, uh, the Naval Air Station established here. Uh, 
Um, they had not only planes, they had uh, blimps down here. Um, and Key West was uh, became uh, a, a, a very important hub in, uh, for, for the U.S. A lot of sub submarine warfare training, anti-submarine warfare training as well. That's what the planes were used for. In the 1920s, the war has ended. Um, and uh, construction began on what was the first overseas highway. This was another idea that had been brewing for a long time, that, hey, we're going to have a road down that connects the islands uh, to the mainland. And in the 20s, it started to become reality. And they ultimately built a, a road that connected uh, the mainland to the upper keys all the way, and it ran all the way down to lower Matacumbe Key. And there... It stopped, people got on a ferry boat, they then rode the ferry boat to No Name Key. And then at No Name, they could continue their journey on down to Key West. So uh, uh, the first overseas highway, this is uh, uh, the beginning of it. Also in the 1920s, air travel began. Uh, first, there was mail service, air mail service between Key West and Cuba. Um, then that turned into passenger service, and then by 1927, uh, Pan Am came down here and established the first regular, regularly scheduled passenger airline service. That was here in Key West and ran to Cuba. So the birth of commercial aviation happened here on this island, believe it or not. 1920s also saw a land boom all across Florida, all right? Um, but that land boom was also uh, uh, evident down here in the Keys in Monroe County. Uh, there were several uh, uh, crazy uh, uh, projects that were planned and all sorts of high values placed on land throughout the Keys, but perhaps the biggest of the Florida swampland land scams happened <laughs> on mainland Monroe County. Uh, developers bought a Native American mound site in the western Everglades, a place called Onion Key. You can see it there. Um, they promised investors that they would turn the remote swampland into a bustling tropical city that they were going to call Poinciana. And there you see the plat for Poinciana. Uh, it looks beautiful. Um, Point Sienna never became more than a set of shacks and tents, and then those even were wiped out in a hurricane in 1926. I gotta say, they sold a lot of land. And when the Everglades National Park was established, the lawyers had a big mess trying to untangle who owned all these different parcels because now it's you know a few decades later and people have forgotten they own land down there. So uh, uh, anyway, Point Sienna. Uh, in the late 20s, 1928, the up-and-coming author Ernest Hemingway somewhat inadvertently wound up here in Key West. He was uh, uh, coming from Cuba, was supposed to pick up a car that was being delivered here for him. The car was late. He stayed in Key West for a few weeks with his wife. They loved it. He thought Key West was the greatest. He was really smitten with the place. Uh, they, they, they left on the car, but he came back a few more times and eventually uh, made his home on the island. Hemingway made no bones about it. He loved the rough and tumble of the place. Uh, and really, this is what he saw. This was the Key West that Hemingway first <laughs> encountered. Uh, now, Key West by the 20s was, uh, uh, you know, the Depression happens and it starts in 29, but Key West was already on the downward slide. Um, we see uh, uh, the uh, Navy had left after World War I, so you don't have the investment that they're making. They're, Cigarettes were becoming popular. That means people don't want cigars. They want those cool new cigarettes that are coming along. Um, there was a sponge blight, affected sponging, and people began moving to Miami because Miami was now this new growing place in the 20s. Um, so Key West is really pretty hard hit in the late 20s, and 
by the early 30s when the depression really starts to take effect, um, Key West and the Florida Keys are hit about as hard as anywhere in the United States was. And it was so bad down here that the federal government, the, 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 the county uh, commission and the city fathers of Key West just turned over the keys to the federal government and said, take it. We have no resources. We can't do it. And so the federal government took charge, and uh, um, that would really affect Key West for really uh, uh, the next few years. Now, to add insult to injury to all of that, in 1935, um, a hurricane struck the upper keys. And it wasn't any ordinary hurricane. It was the strongest hurricane that's ever been recorded. All right? So it absolutely devastated uh, uh, the upper keys. Uh, uh, Isla Mirada, the Tavernier, Key Largo were all just uh, essentially those communities wiped off. Uh, the face of the earth, and uh, um, it also destroyed the railroad. Now, the railroad had never been very successful. They were already, by 1935, in the receivership, and with this now, they just said, forget it. We're not going to rebuild this thing. We're, we're losing money already. So they abandoned the railroad um, and uh, uh, essentially turned over the railway beds to uh, the state. In Key West here, the federal government worked to make uh, uh, the island and the rest of the Keys uh, a tropical paradise, at least in the minds of people. And they, they uh, uh, wanted to take advantage of uh, what was you know, charming architecture, a, a wonderful climate, uh, this you know, subtropical environment, beautiful waters, and really promoted the place as a, a tropical getaway. And, and uh, you know, they generated a lot of beautiful art. We have so much wonderful art from this period of, of uh, the Keys. Um, built the aquarium uh, at that time, and uh, uh, really brought more attention to the Keys. And, and uh, like I say, it worked. And part of that program was to build a new hive. Uh, the, the, the older highway was uh, um, not quite adequate for what the, they had wanted, and so they took over the railway bed, built the road bed on top of the, the railway bridges, and made a, a highway that connected the entirety of the Keys. There no more ferry involved. You could go from Miami all the way to Key West in one shot. And you see then, uh, it had started happening a bit <coughs> before, with the old uh, road, but uh, now uh, this new highway culture involved, highway tourism, people driving down here in their cars at their leisure, stopping along the way and uh, helping these uh, new young communities thrive as they brought tourism uh, to up and down the island chain. More than anything though, whatever the government investment was, the Navy, um, and World War II was really what transformed uh, the islands. It got them out of the Depression because uh, uh, in, in 39, when it became evident that there were going to be problems, uh, the, the U.S. government revitalized the Navy base here, took it out of uh, uh, storage, so to speak, revitalized it, and invested quite a bit into uh, bringing personnel down here, for, for providing a lot of jobs for locals and construction and that sort of thing, and uh, gave the place a, a, a real boost. And with that, the Navy realized, hey, we need water down here. If we're going to invest in this place and put a big base down here, we can't rely on cisterns. We need water. And so they had this ambitious idea that they would install an aqueduct from the mainland all the way down to Key West. And starting in 1941, they began work, and it was completed in 18 months. Uh, got it done. An 18-inch water pipe all the way from uh, uh, near Florida City all the way down to Key West. And, of course, that, and that again, you know, electricity was a revolution. The railway, the road, this was another one. Because for from the beginning, people had been relying on cisterns. You know, still see them in the houses around here little concrete tanks where water would flow from the roof into the cistern, and that's what you drank, um, whether you had worm larvae.
larvae or mosquito larvae in it or not, you drank it. Um, and that's all there was. And uh, this changed the game entirely. Because now there's water on demand for pretty much everybody up and down the Keys. After the war, which ended successfully for the U.S., we see President Harry Truman come to Key West in 1946, establish his little White House, made 11 trips to the island. Uh, and really, again, much like those reporters had in, in 1898, he brought a huge press corps with him. And all those bylines were from Key West, and people saw pictures of Truman in this wonderful place. You got all these people now, uh, uh, you know, post-war era, eager to travel and do things. Eisenhower follows him. Kennedy follows Eisenhower. And for really quite a while, the keys are, are uh, getting some well, publicity you just couldn't pay enough for. And with uh, all that good coverage, people said, hey, that looks really cool. I'd love to go down there. I'd love to buy a place down there. <laughs> well, people started buying the, the other keys and, and uh, developing them. And so you see this huge post-war boom up the keys. So uh, this is Summerlin Key, um, and here you have uh, uh, Key Colony uh, off Marathon. So these places, they, they you know, clear the land, dig canals, build houses, and all these people in this post-war boom would snap them up. You start seeing tourism increase as well. Conk train comes into play, and, and uh, uh, other places up and down the key. See the, the whole concept of a motel, and you know the, these resort motels popping up, and, and uh, uh, another uh, big change: swimming pools. There's water; you can fill a pool now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, you start seeing that, and that of course increases yeah. tourism. So uh, uh, all that development starts affecting nature, and people realize it. And in the 30s, even, people were saying, hey, uh, key deer and big pine were in trouble. By 1950, there were 30 key deer left. And uh, uh, people started saying, we need to save these creatures. And they did, and they worked. It took many years, but by 1956, 7, uh, the Key Deer National Wildlife Refuge was established to help uh, save the key deer. Same thing happening underwater. People are realizing, hey, we've got these beautiful reefs. We really need to protect them. And so in 1960, John Pennekamp Coral Reef State Park was established, the very first underwater park anywhere in the world off Key Largo. And that then uh, not only made people realize that we have a beautiful reef here, but it made the Upper Keys, Key Largo in particular, one of the great uh, diving meccas uh, anywhere. So uh, a reputation that it still holds. Now, 1960 saw another setback. Hurricane Donna hit uh, the Upper Keys. Marathon, in particular, was uh, really, really hit hard, as was uh, the Isla Mirada area. Um, I think all of us, uh, this is one of our worst nightmares right here. Bridge wiped out, water pipe torn into pieces. What would we do if that happened today? I mean, imagine. Uh, but uh, they rebuilt. Came back better than ever. 1962, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, comes into play. This sets a new tone for the military down here. They realize, my goodness, uh, uh, the keys are, are crucial to protecting the U.S. against Cuba. Uh, Smathers lined with missiles and barbed wire. This even uh, went all the way up to Key Largo. So the entire keys were armed, armored against uh, Cuba. And uh, that led then to a, a pretty big Cold War development. Um, in the 60s, we see people starting to uh, um, say, hey, you know, we got a lot of these really neat old houses and buildings. We need to preserve them. And uh, um, that started uh, in the 60s when the Audubon House here uh, was slated to be torn down and turned into a gas station. And there was a group in town said, no way. And uh, um, that really sparked a, uh, 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 well, what do I say, an investment in these old conch houses. Um, that was picked up, uh, that torch sort of was picked up by um, 
in the 70s and the 80s and even 90s, uh, in large measure by the gay community. A lot of um, people coming here uh, found Key West a very accommodating place, and they also came with a lot of money and could buy these homes and fix them up. And uh, so we see a lot of uh, historic preservation starting in the 60s and continuing on, continuing on today. We lost a few. This is the Convent of Mary Immaculate. Um, I think probably one of the most spectacular buildings ever on this island was torn down. The church didn't want to invest in it. But other gems have been preserved, and we are eternally thankful for that. 1960s, uh, we see, again, uh, uh, the development continues. More uh, uh, housing built up and down the Keys. Shrimping is really booming at this point. Um, we're seeing the, the suburbanization of the Keys, if you will, so moving away from downtown Key West, um, and we have Searstown being built, Newtown being built, uh, and the same thing happening up the Keys where you have shopping centers built, Marathon built in Key Largo. And in 1965, after 100 years, schools are reintegrated, or not re, are integrated. Um, so a lot of social change going on in the 60s as well. Uh, so, uh, again, the Cold War period, um, that, that period from 50s, 60s, 70s, saw a huge military investment. Um, here we see Naval Station. This is the entrance to the Truman Annex you can go through today. There's still a guard shack there, not that one, but uh, similar scenario. Submarine base, they did a lot of... Uh, uh, Submarine training, sonar school, diver training, a lot going on down here. And then Boca Chica Naval Air Station, um, to this day, still in operation as one of the unparalleled Navy fighter pilot training uh, uh, facilities in the U.S. So a lot going on there, but priorities changed for the military. In 1974, they closed Naval, Naval Station Key West. This is the last... Uh, last, uh, uh, what do they call it, the inspections. Um, and with that, Key West, the economy just cratered. I, I've always heard stories that, oh, you know, after the, the Navy closed, you could roll a bowling ball down the ball and you wouldn't hit a thing. And uh, came across this photo in our collection. Wow. And it shows it. <laughs> it really was like that. This is in December of 1974. Uh, Key West was in dire straits, and things were not looking good. And they did, the, 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 the business leaders, community uh, uh, leaders said, we're going to become a tourist town again. And they really began to promote Key West uh, for uh, tourism. But there were some bumps along the way. 1980, uh, the Mariel boat lift happens, where uh, people who are wanting to get out of Cuba, uh, uh, Castro, finally just says, okay, go, and not only that, but he, he let the, the people who were unsatisfied, but he also let prisoners and mental patients and all leave as well. And uh, they all loaded on boats, came here to Key West. They then, they didn't stay here in Key West, and they went on to the mainland. But all the images that came out in the reporting, this went on for months, and 125,000 people came through Key West. This is what the country saw. And they thought, oh my gosh, Key West is just overrun with all these refugees. And, and uh, again, things just came to a grinding halt and uh, it looked pretty grim for Key West uh, for a while there. Um, another thing that was, was throttling uh, development in some ways was the road system. It's starting to age. It's, uh, uh, um, no longer satisfactory for the, the amount of traffic that's traveling up and down the road. Two-lane road, it's too narrow, it's dangerous, the bridges are like this, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, everybody realized, hey, we need to upgrade the overseas highway. So in the 1970s and in the 1980s, you see the redevelopment of the overseas highway. This is uh, Bay of Honda. Uh, this is the old bridge, it's decaying now. Here's the new one that we drive on today. This was 1972, I believe that opened. And in 1982, the new Seven Mile Bridge opened. And with that, I think uh, one of the great effects on modern Key West is really allowed people and 
you know, traffic and goods and things to come in uh, <clears throat> full bore down here. Now there was this mindset, I think, that you start seeing evolve in the probably in the 1970s, certainly by the 1980s, that Key West is this place for others, you know, <laughs> people that don't fit in to uh, uh, typical, typical American life. And, you know, these three guys probably personify it as well as anybody. Captain Tony, uh, Jimmy Buffett, and Mel Fisher, all people who sort of lived uh, on the fringes of life. Um, I, I, I don't think any of us should ever underestimate the effect that the song Margaritaville has had on our community. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, that whole uh, uh, idea of outsiders was really cemented in 1982 um, when the U.S. Border Patrol closed the overseas highway at Florida City and checked everybody going in and out of the Keys. Uh, they checked their immigration status and they were also checking for drugs. And that, again, put a halt on everything that people uh, down here in you know, Key West in particular, were irate, saying you're, you're preventing people from coming down here, and this is our lifeblood. Mm -hmm. And uh, they appealed to the federal government, said, please lift this roadblock, it's killing us. Federal government didn't listen, so uh, uh, Mayor Dennis Wardlow at the time, uh, Key West, and, and a whole bunch of locals, you can see, got together, held a rally, seceded from the United States, became the, declared themselves the Conk Republic, um, and then, of course, you know, promptly surrendered and asked for foreign aid. It was, you know, <laughs> there was genuine anger, and, and it was, you know, expressed through what, you know, what was really a, a, a meant to get attention, um, and it worked. Uh, people uh, did pay attention, and the roadblock was lifted. So uh, sometimes it takes extreme measures to make things happen, and of course, that now uh, we celebrate every year that day. <laughs> So uh, um, the, the hippie ethic, you know, there were a lot of hippies that came to Key West in the 60s and 70s. We see still remnants of the hippie ethic in the sunset celebration. People used to go down and just watch the sunset and clap as it went down. You know, something as simple as that. Um, and that turned then into, a, you know, what we see at Mallory Square still to this day, uh, 50 years later, the same thing happening. Uh, the, idea then sort of became over time and particularly in the, the, the 70s and the 80s and again that Key West was a party place and, and uh, that was I think personified by a, a fantasy fest, an event that was started originally to boost uh, tourism in a slow period of time in October um, and it was wildly successful as we all know and it still thrives today. In the 80s, we see uh, uh, another big wave of development, um, largely from this one man, Pritam Singh. He bought uh, the, the excess uh, naval or Key West Naval Station, redeveloped that into the Truman Annex uh, complex, um, then moved on, built uh, other developments in Key West, Stock Island, uh, Knights Key, Marathon, Duff Key. Um, he has really, uh, uh, more than any one person, I think, uh, built uh, major developments in the Keys and really helped change the face of the islands. We see in also, uh, at the same time, the idea, the notion of sort of mass tourism really coming into effect. Cruise ships start coming in the 1980s, really uh, picking up in the 90s and uh, bringing in you know, the thousands of people on every ship. And in the late 80s, we see not only in reaction to cruise ships and things like that, but uh, uh, there had been an oil spill, the Exxon Valdez. People were very worried. Hey, we've got this amazing reef down here. Um, it, as wonderful as it is, it's, it's not in the greatest health. It, it's very fragile. Uh, we really need to protect the, uh, the reef here. And so the idea grew of establishing a national marine sanctuary that would encompass all of the Florida Keys and all of the reef. And uh, through great debate and, and a lot of political tension um, in the late 1980s, uh, finally in 1990, Congress uh, signed the act. President Bush uh, uh, passed 
asset as well uh, for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, which uh, to this day affects our, uh, you know, how we deal as people with the, uh, the waters around here. Uh, in the 90s, you see a lot of maturity and growth happening in the communities of the, uh, the Upper Keys. Um, for, for ages, the only cities had been Key West, then uh, the small city of Leighton, and the city of Key Colony Beach. Uh, but in um, the later 1990s, the Marathon is incorporated in uh, 1997, and Isla Morada, or excuse me, I got the first. Isla Morada in 1997, Marathon in 1999. Again, just reflecting that these, these places uh, are becoming sort of, they've grown so much, they're their own independent communities. Now, hurricanes have been a persistent threat forever down here, but it seems like uh, uh, more recently we've been seeing or been affected by them more. Uh, and uh, in the last 30 years, 30, 25 years, we've had a Hurricane George, Wilma, Irma, and most recently here in Key West, Hurricane Ian. All of them bringing a lot of uh, destruction and sort of forcing a renewal for a lot of us that we really hadn't wanted. Um, what's happening today is history, too. Uh, you know, the headlines of today are tomorrow's history. So, you know, we have sea level rise happening. Still, this debate about mass tourism, what's acceptable, what do we want for our future. Um, we have still reef issues that are being dealt with, uh, immigration issues. Uh, this past winter, we saw a lot of people coming on these little boats from Cuba, and of course, housing. How are people going to afford to live here? Those are all things that somebody like me is going to be talking about 200 years from now. Uh, Let's get back to the notion of county. You see in the brown, the original Monroe County, and then the orange, modern Monroe County. If that original county had stayed intact, we would have 6.2 million Monroe County residents. <laughs> I know I'm grateful it changed, because if it didn't, I'd be talking for about 6.2 million hours. So anyway, I'm going to call it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Uh, thank you for coming. Appreciate it.